second week, last week, we talked about uh, the whole demonic thing. Um, if Jesus lives in us, then why do demons still attack us? And so that was fun. It's all on the app. They're all uploaded to the app. Today, we're going to be dealing with, um, it's actually a three-parter. And honestly, it could have been a five-parter. We've narrowed it down to a three-parter. It's a big one, and I want you to kind of put your seatbelts on, and I want you to kind of go with us. And we're going to take, um, take some trips down some roads to, to just explore every angle of this thing, and then even probably have to take it on another week or so um, regarding does God still do miracles. Today, we're going to deal with the signs and the wonders portion of miracles. And so we're just going to ask the Lord to just continue um, to open our eyes about these things and to help us. All right, guys, big question, man. And let me reiterate quickly. I'm jacked out of my mind about this series. Mm-hmm. It's stretching please us. Please submit a question. Amen. Mm-hmm. Please, please, please submit a question. Uh, and I promise you, we will try to cover it one way or the other. Uh, I love that this is going to stretch us all the way through the summertime, so do not hold your questions back. We are tailoring a sermon around those questions. Amen. Now, guys, today's a big question, and, and let's go ahead and look on the, uh, on the screen real quick. This is a three-parter. Here's a question, uh, Mark 16, 17, and 18. Let me give you the background on this quickly. This is Jesus' last words in Mark, also found in Luke, and Matthew is called the Great Commission. This is right before Jesus ascended into heaven. This is the command that he left the apostles. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So the question is, number one, three parts, remember. Number one, why do we see or why do we not see signs and the manifest presence of God here in the West, in other words, here in this church in the United States. Come on, let's go to question number two. Let's look at this. Is a church in America lacking the Holy Spirit of God in its weekly services, or are we, the people, the problem for not letting the Spirit flow to do the Spirit's work? The third part of the question is this. Jesus confirmed his message with signs and wonders, and I wonder if this is supposed to be happening Today, man, I don't know about you, but I am excited about this message. Today, we're going to receive some divine revelation from the Spirit of God. Are you ready today? Come on, let's get into this. Amen. These are some juicy questions, so please submit. I have a good feeling that based on today's message, there's going to come question. There's going to come questions out of this question. Um, But let's let's kind of break it down, and uh, we're going to try to hit as many angles as we possibly can, and keep on running. Why do we not see signs here in the West? So we're assuming that the person that wrote this is speaking, um, and maybe has even been overseas, or has maybe heard stories of pastors talking about overseas. Um, I know that um, Samantha's mom is back in town, and I know that she um, has a an orphanage um, in the Philippines, and she does a lot of ministry um, uh, outside of the U.S. And so for those of us that have been overseas or, or have heard stories about that, um, we do often hear about the amazing miracles that happen there. Here's what we fall into, though, that anything that we look at in life has a highlight reel. Is anybody with me? So there's a highlight reel. I remember us sitting um, with pastors over 17 years of living in parsonages with pastors and, and, and being with there and, and, and traveling in revival and hearing amazing stories. Um, heard, we've heard amazing stories about when we prepare to go overseas, there's a, certain things that we have to do as pastors, as evangelists, bringing the word at that pulpit, is that sometimes you don't want to actually get to the pulpit when you get up there and say, like we do in the U.S., somebody praise the Lord, because here we'll just go and we'll give them a little golf clap. Thank you, Jesus. Over there you say, come on, somebody praise the Lord, and those people will begin praising the Lord, and three hours later they'll still be praising the Lord because their commitment level, their devotion level, they don't have all of the other thing, the ancillary things. They don't all have a phone on their hip and five TVs in their home. Are you with me? So a lot of times the devotion is greater and as a result the respect for the Lord and who he is and how he is and and who he is to them is very different than us here in the U.S. with all of our stuff going on. Does that make sense? 
So there's certain things that we definitely want to look at, but we don't want to just check that off and say, yeah, that's why we don't see more of it. I believe that we do see it. I do believe that we see signs and wonders. I do believe that we see it. I believe that what we have sometimes is we have a highlight reel, just the way that you go on Facebook and you see everybody's highlights. Nobody really ever posts that my kid just failed math and I just beat him within an inch of his life. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, and those people normally get, get taken off of Facebook real quickly. The thing is, is that we see the highlight reel and we can hear the highlight reel of what's going on over there. But this is what I know. There is a highlight reel that we can do even for Restore Church, even for our family. So let's go ahead and do a highlight reel real quickly here. The Bible says, and this is the scripture that we're studying, um, in my name they will cast out demons. Now here's a biggie, and we'll get into this at another sermon. Um, how many of you have ever seen or been in a service or witnessed or been a part of somebody casting out a demon? Come on. Hands. Wow. Does anybody see that? Okay. Highlight reel. How many of us speak in other tongues? Don't be ashamed. Don't be like, yeah, I do. So you do? All right, cool. If you're wondering, we are going to open up that whole thing in a whole nother service. We're going to give it an entire service where we're speaking on the gifts of the Spirit, and we're speaking on um, and explaining biblically what that is and, and leaving it with you to take it to the Lord to do whatever you want with it. All right? So there's our highlight reel. How many of you have ever seen, witnessed, or been a part of, or God did for you, a major healing? I want to see a hand. Wow. Do you see the highlight reel? If we passed a microphone right here and now, we could stand up and go around the room and talk about the, the manifestations of God's spirit in our lives. We could talk about what God did, what he brought us out of, and what he brought us through. There are healings that still take place, and there are manifestations that are still happening. We just have to be careful of the highlight reel that we're looking at and listening to and make it a very good point on a daily basis to remember what God has done for us. Amen? You know, I, I love that highlight reel because how many of you watch Sports Center? Man, I'm a big fan of Sports Center. And wh what do they show? Do they show your mistakes? Mm -mm. No, they show the miraculous plays. Do they not? The same thing when we look at overseas and different things. You see the highlight reel. You, you see a thousand people respond to the altar. Yeah. You don't see the 8,000 that didn't. Right. Are you with me, guys? Right. Come on. In fact, one of the greatest um, faith healers, Oral Roberts, if you know who he is, um, his entire ministry was about faith miracles, about healing miracles. Um, and he's even reported many times of saying that there have been times that he was so distraught um, before the Lord about the numbers and scores of people. Because mind you, when he would do a meeting, he would have in the upwards of 10 20, sometimes 100,000 people, depending on where he would do it across the country. And so there were times that he was so distraught that so many didn't receive, so many weren't healed to the place where he got before the Lord and said, Lord, why isn't everyone being healed? And I, I just, I feel like it's, it, it's, we're not getting anywhere and I don't understand it. And he would get frustrated. And then God would say, you're not going to stop praying for people for healing because of those that didn't receive, because then there won't be people to receive. So we have to understand that, that we don't understand all of God's ways, but we do understand that it's important that we're looking at the right real. Amen? All right, guys, let's, let's look at the next part. And we, or are we, the people, the problem for not letting the Holy Spirit work in our churches? Great question. So I think that we would all um, agree, based on what we already said about just our devotion, I think that we've become a couple of things. And you know, Anthony, he loves his um, using words that all kind of come together with that same letter. And here it is. Be honest, we've become sophisticated. If God showed up right here, right now, and you were 90 years old like Sarah was, when God, when the angel came and said to Sarah, you're going to have a child right now while you're 90 and your husband's 99. In this world, right here and now, we wouldn't go, woohoo! We would probably go, all right, I have faith, God, that you can do anything. But it's possible to have faith and unbelief at the same time. And what I mean by that is this we would have faith that God could work, but most of us would probably leave the angel and go straight to Google. And Google what is the latest that any woman has ever given birth in their lifetime. Would we not? 
And what we would do is we would begin to suck in this unbelief of going, okay, God said it, and I believe he can, but has it ever been done before? We've become so sophisticated that we don't just walk by faith and take his answer for it. And instead, we've got a million different ways to try to reason out what God just told us. And we've become so sophisticated that sometimes we talk ourselves out of miracles. Isn't that amazing? Instead of going to God, we go to Google. Come on, guys, right? That's what would happen because of uh, we're so sophisticated. Let's look at number two. We're too secular. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what's the Bible say? And all these things will be added unto you. But here's the problem. We don't put God first. He's last on our list. Come on. Do you realize you can take your checkbook? Or you can look at your calendar and find out what you put the most emphasis on. And more than likely, it's not God according to your checkbook. Come on, shake your head this way. Let me know you're still with me. Amen. It's not your checkbook. It's, and before you know it, you look at your calendar and find out where you spend your most time. That's where your heart is. The Bible says where your, your, your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Mm-hmm. Now think about that. We, we're so secular that we never put him first. He's so far down the list that sometimes we forget that he's even there. That's why we don't see signs and wonders like we want to see him. Let's look at the third part. Number one, we, or number three, we become a skeptic. Mm. Hmm. You know, there, there's a mentality that says, you know, if, if I would or if I could just see with my own eyes a true blue bona fide miracle or a sign, wonder, whatever you want to call it, if I could just see it, then I would believe. Hmm. But, you know, they, people said that all through the Old and New Testament. You know, it, the Bible talks about in the book of Exodus and also the book of Numbers that, that uh, God performed mighty miracles through a man of God by the name of Moses, right? We heard in Exodus how God brought ten plagues and, and, and destroyed the land of Egypt and divinely delivering them out of a 400-year prison sentence. That if that was not a miracle enough, then all of a sudden God calls a wind to blow. I said it was a Holy Ghost hurricane. Can I get a witness? And all of a sudden the wind began to blow. And the Bible says that the Israelites walked on dry ground across the Red Sea. Come on. That was a sign. That was a wonder. They experienced that. They witnessed that, if you will. But then all of a sudden now they're in the wilderness. And then in the wilderness, guess what happened? During the daytime, God protected them with a cloud so it wouldn't get too hot. At nighttime, the desert is freezing, right? So what happened, at nighttime, God gave them fire so they wouldn't get too cold. Then he miraculously fed them with bread or with manna and with quail. God continued to show up, show out, and show off in their lives and miracle signs and wonders they experienced on a daily basis. But then all of a sudden they got to one of their destinations and guess what happened? The same ones, watch this, that witnessed the miracles were the same ones that whined when it didn't happen the way they wanted it to happen. And just because they experienced it firsthand, they stopped believing that God was who he said he was. So just because you witness it, don't mean, be, don't mean that you're going to ultimately believe it. Are you with me? And you realize it also happened in the New Testament. The Bible says that one day, uh, actually on the Sabbath, that Jesus, the sinless Savior, made his way inside the synagogue. And the Pharisees were checking him out. They were there trying to see if Jesus would break their religious laws by performing a miracle on the Sabbath. The Bible says that Jesus walked up to a man that had a withered or a paralyzed or arthritic hand. And the Bible says Jesus looked at the man's hand. Then he said, stick it in your cloak. When he pulled it out, come on, it was a now you see me, now you don't immediate miracle. The guy's hand was restored like it was brand new. Then the Bible says later that day, uh, some people brought a man to Jesus that was possessed by the devil. He was blind. He was deaf. He was mute. And I love what happened. Jesus laid hands on the man, rebuked the devil, and spoke healing over his body. Can I tell you today that when he did that, 
that was a direct fulfillment of a 700-year-old prophecy written and recorded by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 35, 5, and 6 that said that the Son of God will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Come on, guys. The blind eyes will open. The deaf will hear. The lame will leap for joy. Now, think about this. The Pharisees and the religious people saw that on a daily basis for three and a half years. You thought they would believe it because they seen it, right? Not the case. Let's, let's look at the next verse. One day, some of the Jewish leaders, including some Pharisees, came to Jesus asking him to show them a miracle. Now, that's the same chapter where he just healed the man's hand. The same chapter where he cast out the devil and where the guy's eyesight was healed, his hearing came back, his, his tongue was begin to be loose and he could speak for the very first time and the devil was cast out of him. Can I tell you that Jesus' response was this, only an evil and faithless generation would seek any further proof. You know, I love what Jesus said. At the very end of John chapter 20, he said, blessed are those who don't see and still believe. Can I tell you today that we've seen signs and wonders and miracles around altars and, and every manifestation, good, bad, right, wrong. Come on, the fruit, the fake, and the flake always show up when you have a real move of God. Can I get a witness up in here today? Listen to me. We've seen everything you can think of as evangelists for 17 years. But... I'm standing here today to tell you, if I never see another person saved, he's still the Savior. If I never see another person healed, he's still the healer. Come on. If I never see another person delivered, he's still my deliverer. Because blessed are those who don't see and yet still believe. Come on, guys. Amen. All right, so you're fixing to hear 17 years of being on the road. And uh, being an evangelist, and, and basically what it means to be an evangelist on the road, it means that you are a safe place um, for people to come to to share with you things that they've not told anybody else. Why? Because you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. Um, you get to take their, their secret with you. They, they um, can look you in the eyes right now because they don't have to look you in the eyes tomorrow. Um, so as a result of that, uh, th we're fair game to unload a whole lot of stuff on. And as a result of that, people come to altars. They flood the altars. Why? Because, uh, but, uh, because oftentimes people believe that evangelists have magic hands or different prayers than a pastor does. Right, John? Um, and, and, that, and that somehow an evangelist can pray something different than a pastor can pray. And, and I get that. I, I kind of get that as a wife. I understand that I can tell Anthony something for like 10 years, and then Matt can come along and tell him one time, and Anthony will go, oh, my gosh. And I'm like, I've been telling you that for 10 years. So does anybody understand? So, I mean, that's kind of how that is. Sometimes it just takes another mouth. It takes another um, perspective. It takes somebody else to bring something um, that, that we receive differently, right? I think we've all done that. So here's the question. Um, why do we not see, this was the question. This is not our take. Why do we not see the manifest presence of God? Now, as we prayed over this, um, this is where God wanted us to go. Be careful how you define the manifest presence of God. I didn't talk to the person that wrote it about the question, but I will say this. Why do we not see the manifest presence of God in our services in the United States or in any church, really? And here's what the, the Holy Spirit just really laid on us. We've got to be very careful how we define a move of God and how we define a manifestation of God's presence. And let me tell you, why I say this. Somewhere along the way, we started believing that a manifestation of God's presence was walking into a church and it was absolute pandemonium with people, everybody raising their hands and screaming out and speaking in tongues and running around the church and everybody laid out on the altar. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. So somewhere along the way, we began defining the manifest presence of God as that. We began saying, oh my gosh, God is, God's moving in that church. I can't tell you, and Anthony said it just a moment ago, what we've seen. We've seen, we've seen it, that the, thi the, 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 the 
fog of the Holy Spirit was so thick in a place that you would literally walk in the back doors and just feel God's conviction. That I would call a move of God. Everybody running around and, and, and everyone speaking in tongues and it being crazy and laid out on the floor. We've seen, as Anthony said, the real and we've also seen emotionalism. We've seen people around the altar bawling their eyes out and crying, but we've also seen people on all fours barking like a dog and calling that the Spirit of God. We have seen people roll across the altar because they were holy rollers. We have seen it all. I promise you, my friend, we have seen it all. And here's the thing. We have to be very careful what we're asking for and what we define to be a move of God. And here's why um, it's important because we can be swept away with certain things God never un intended us to go from experience to experience and dry places in the middle what he desires is for commitment to him devotion to him not us just living off of the next experience is anybody with me yeah. pastor L listen we're, you you, you got to realize Paul said don't forbid speaking in tongues Paul said Paul also said I think God I speak in tongues more than all of you so we're, we're not saying that we don't believe in a manifestation. We but, do. But scripture, Absolutely. But, but if you read 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about how everything should be in order. See, what we're believing for is a bunch of balanced believers. Can yeah. you say amen? That operate in the spirit as the spirit wants to operate. Amen. Because you remember the Bible says, and we're going to get in this and do a teaching later. The Bible says if we're all speaking in tongues, when a person comes in that's new, guess what they're going to do? They're going to think we're crazy. Yeah. That's what Paul said. So there's got to be an order to the Spirit of God moving in our lives. And we're going to hit that later and as well. And, the word, and we'll get it into it another time. But the word even says that, the, that um, tongues is, is one of the least, least of the gifts. So we put so much emphasis on, oh, that's God. But at the same time, his spirit and the spirit's working is so much more than what we as the American church has defined as a move of God. So we have to be very careful of what we're looking for. My, my home church down in Melbourne, some of you went with Jennifer and I a couple of years ago down there. Uh, man, I love that story, super success story. They, yeah. they started with just a handful of people. Now they're running uh, about fifteen to 1,800 people about 17 to 18 years later. Just a mighty move of God. Now remember, when he took it, it was a very traditional church. Uh, and, and it had just a handful of people. And as they began to grow, some of the elders walked up to my, my pastor, Ken Height, the pastor there. And he said, Ken, we're not seeing God move like we used to. And there's a problem there. Don't ever compare the past with what God has for the future. Come on, he's the doing Bible, a new you, thing. The Bible says he's doing a new thing. You, you know, the Bible says that the future days will be greater than the latter days. Amen. See, here's the thing. A lot of us have stuck in the past so we can never get to our purpose. Come on. Oh, come on. You didn't hear what That's I said. A, whole other a lot of us are stuck in our past. We'll never get to a purpose because we, we keep looking behind instead of looking forward. Here's the key. So that some of the elders, watch this, the, some of the elders walked up to Ken and said, Pastor, uh, we are not seeing the gifts of the Spirit move in our service like we used to. But meanwhile, the church is growing by leaps and bounds. Go figure. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what do you want? He goes, well, man, we want to see people uh, laid out all over the floor, and it, look, I, I don't have any issue with that we if it's really God. Yep. Come on. I'm all for whatever is really God, and when it's not God, I will run out. Come on, guys. So here's the key. He said, what, what we want, we want the manifest presence of God. We want to see this, this, and this. So Ken said, oh, so what you're saying is you want to see the gifts of the Spirit. He goes, absolutely. He said, well, how about the fruit of the Spirit? Can you name those for me? Can you name the fruit of the Spirit? These elders, come on, these seasoned saints, <laughs> the ones that wanted to shout and jump over pews, come on, I've done it. Come on. Yep. All right. So anyway, the, these seasoned saints could not name but one or two fruits hmm. of the Spirit. Come on. They wanted the power, but they did not want to walk and talk yes. in that power. Come on. So they did not know the fruit of the Spirit. And the funny thing is, the church continue to flourish and continue to grow because all of a sudden he said for the first time in this church's existence we did thing and it did things in a biblical perspective and in a biblical order and that's when God showed up like he never showed up before amen so I, I want to make this point because our pastor believes in the gifts of the spirit and so do we just look at your neighbor real quick and say 
they believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Just say that real quick. Because I don't want you walking out of there going, so they explain themselves out of healing. No, we believe in healing. Um, they explain themselves out of the, the gifts of the Spirit. No, we didn't. No, we believe in all of those things. But this is what we understand. We understand that the manifestation and the workings of the Spirit is not just those things found in the verse in Mark that we opened with. The gifts of the Spirit, the working of the Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit, according to Scripture, is far more greater than a, an experience that we have deemed to be a move of God. And let's take a look at the role of the Holy Spirit according to Scripture. Because if we're going to ask the question, and the question was literally proposed like this, are we lacking the Holy Spirit of God in our services? Not necessarily here, but in all of America, but we'll answer for here too. Are we lacking the Spirit of God in the services? And if you look at the role of the Holy Spirit according to Scripture, you will see that the Spirit is working yeah. in our churches. Yeah. Yeah. It is working in our churches. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? How many know that the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a gift giver, right? Yeah. All right, yeah. now, now let's look at this quickly. Here's the role of the, the Spirit of God according to the Bible. Number one, he's a convictor of sin. Yeah. He doesn't condemn you, but he does convict you, right? That's the moving of the Spirit. Get, when you do something wrong and you got that gut check, guess what that is? That's the Holy Ghost. Come on, guys. When you say something you shouldn't have said and you try to take that back and you, you feel guilty, that's the Spirit of God moving Come in on. your life. Watch this. Uh, we also find out he's the revealer of truth unto salvation. Do you realize no man can be saved unless the Spirit of God draws him. Yeah. When we have an altar call, when people rededicate their life to Christ, or, or when Jennifer and I were on the road with the power team, we saw literally 10,000 people come to the saving grace and knowledge. Guess what? It was the Holy Spirit of God that drew those people in gymnasiums all over America. Mm -hmm. it was th that was the role of the Spirit of God. He's drawing people, come leading, on. guiding, directing them to the cross of Calvary. Yep. That's the role of the Spirit of God. Number two, he's our helper. Come on, we can't do anything without him. Mm -hmm. He's our guide. Mm -hmm. Thank God he guides us into all truth. Can you see? Amen. That's the role of the Spirit of God. He's our comforter. Come on. When you can't be comforted by anybody else, and all of a sudden, when you have that personal prayer time, come on, I'm preaching to somebody, and that daily devotion, and all of a sudden, the presence and the power of God visits you right where you're at. Amen. And he lets you know that everything is going to be all right. Yep. He's our comforter. Come on. He's our counselor. He tells us what we should and shouldn't say. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us bypass that. Come on. I'm going to leave that there. Yep. He's our encourager, according to John 14 and verse 16. Think about that. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is, is if we're asking the question, is the Holy Spirit at work? And let's do it right now. Is the, wor the work of the Holy Spirit at work here? The answer is yes. Why? Because we feel convicted of sin in this place. We, 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 we learn truth in this place, right? Um, we, um, we're comforted by him when we walk in. That's what Pastor just said, that we're comforted. We are counseled by him. We are encouraged by him. He's also a gift giver, making the body a complete body. So we're discovering gifts in this place. There are people that, that came into this place broken and hurting and needing comfort and needing counseling. And as a result, now today, they're not only saved and, and healed and, and delivered out of their stuff, but now they're developing and discovering gifts that are on the inside of them that they're now using for God. So how do we know that the Spirit is working? All of these things are in place. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to be a fruit producer, which is what Pastor Ken said to his council. You want the manifestations of the Spirit? Then name the fruits of the Spirit. Because you don't get the power of God without the holiness of God. Are you with me? So we're looking at, is he a fruit producer? Is that what's being developed here and in our churches across America, even if everybody's not laid out on the floor? Absolutely. They're developing in love and joy and peace and patience. If you have a kid in, in a kid's church right now, they're studying the fruits of the Spirit. Why? It's important that they understand that being a Christian and being on fire for God means that we're developing in character. We're growing and changing, not just having a spiritual experience that gives us a high for about three days, and then we come back down. Are you with me? 
we can experience and have those moments, but most of the time, my greatest experiences have been in my living room, on my face, during my devotion times with God. I have felt more of the presence of God sometimes in my car and in my living room than I have in some of the greatest churches in America. Why? Because it's about private devotion, and that's what makes way for public ministry. Are you with me? We... um. People will often say, um, so are you guys Pentecostal, or are you guys, I, I don't understand. And we always say, we're Baptocostal. We're, we want the foundation of understanding who we are, why we are, what we believe, and to understand that God is bigger than any of us think that we've got him in a box, right? And so we have to understand that, that one of the, the, the convictions of Pastor and myself, if you've ever wondered, so you guys speak um, in other tongues, and, and you believe in manifestations, but at the same time, how come, it, how come people aren't running around the building? And here's part of the reason. Um, we saw on the road for 17 years everything known to man, as I said a moment ago. But one thing kicked my tail more than anything. And I know for Anthony it was something different, but for me it was something specific. Um, we used to attend uh, a church every year for revival. We would go back and do revival at this same place. It was uh, in Highlands County. I'm sorry? It was a yearly stop, was a yearly stop for us. It was in um, Highlands County. And I remember a group of people, they were, um, they were thrill seekers. They ran after every revival. They went to Brownsville. We went to Brownsville revival, revival, if you know anything about that. But they would go all the way up to the Toronto outpouring up there. They were those types of people. There was a whole group of them in that church that were kind of just following the Spirit of God all over the U.S. because um, in those years, God was pouring out His Spirit in, in major ways um, all over the country. And that's still happening today. But there was this one woman by the name of Robin, and I'll never forget her because she, she, you know, we would do dinner every now and again when we would go um, for revival. And I remember, um, I remember her coming back from one of those revivals, and I remember her being kind of ultra spiritual. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And um, and like Anthony said, the fruits, the flakes, and the and the and the fakes, right? And so she was pretty solid. But then something happened, and she began seeking signs and wonders. And remember, signs and wonders are supposed to follow us, not us follow them. And so as a result of that, she just got to this place where it was really all about manifestation and nothing about her walk. And I knew this by the fact that she was the one shouting the loudest in church. But when her 16-year-old daughter came home pregnant, she kicked her out and said, You are not welcome here. Goodbye. We are Christians, and we don't do that thing. And the daughter was thinking, yeah, we kind of do. I just did. Here I am. And I went home that week so distraught that we somehow have missed it so badly that we think that it is about our shout instead of our talk and our walk. Are you with me? And so when we saw that, we began to say, Lord, if it's you, we want it. But what's most important is that we walk in love. What's most important is, according to Scripture, that we have the fruits of the Spirit instead. And if we don't, then we just become a fruit in the Spirit. Are you with me? Did you hear that? Fruit of the Spirit or fruit in the Spirit? Come on, that's good. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Here's the issue I have with people that, that were sign seekers but not faithful followers or they, they were not Bible believers. They were just seeking a sign. Here's what happens. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1, the Apostle Paul said, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have what? Love. Love. Wow, that's the first gift or first fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Think about that. He said, If I speak in tongues of men or angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. There's no Amen. power in that tongue if there's no love to back it up. Yeah. Are you with me? All Amen. right, here, let's go further. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1, let love be your highest goal. Come on. Listen, when, when people mess up, they slip, they stumble, they fall, you don't kick them when they're down. You restore them back to health and to holiness. Amen. Yes. Amen. Can you imagine the impact that mama would have had on her daughter and said, hey, baby girl, I know you made a mistake, but guess what? I'm going to wrap my arm around you and love you back to health. Yes. That's what Jesus would have did. Remember the woman caught in adultery? Come on. Pharisees 
had rocks in their hand. Come on, that, that's right. I love that, man. She was caught in the act of Amen. adultery. Yep. But some chauvinistic men brought her. They let the other man alone and let him go. Come on. It might have been one of the buddies. Are you with me? <laughs> Come on. Now think about this. They were ready to stone her to death. They looked at Jesus. And they said, what would you do? Jesus, I love you. You know what he did? He didn't throw a rock at her. He didn't remind her of all of her sin. He got down on her level, and he loved her back to health yeah. and wholeness because we are supposed to walk in love and let love be our highest goal. Come on, guys. Amen. So how do we know? Amen. So how do we know that the Lord is at work? Because according to 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I'm going to tell you right now, I can't tell you, we were just this past Monday at a celebration with Kirk and his N.A. folks. We have N.A. Narcotics Anonymous meets here uh, every Monday night at 730. Kirk leads us, leads them. We came in on Monday evening to help him celebrate one year of N.A. being right here at Restore Church. Yeah. I took a photo in the back. Um, just of the, the number of people, I think, I think it's 17 that night, and we walked in to sit in the back, and Kirk was sharing his story and his testimony, and so many of the people that we met prior to, because that wasn't the only time that we had ever come, but many of them have said, I don't know what it is, but when I walked into this church the first time, I felt something. Now, if they don't know what the Spirit of the Lord feels like, or they, don't, they can't articulate it, but they know that there's something warm about this place, that there's something um, that God is doing in this place, there's something about it. There are people that are here as a part of Restore. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is here, and there is freedom. And whether we're all having church or it's an empty building, people can walk in and feel the presence of the Lord, and that's how we know. Kirk, let me ask you a question. You've been doing this for a year. What is the, uh, the same thing you hear every day when people that's never walked in those doors, what do they say when they walk in here? Preach, preach, preach. Amen. You know what they feel? They feel loved, accepted, forgiven, and valuable. Come on, guys. You know why? Because we pray that they feel the Spirit of God when they walk through those doors. Amen. That is a mighty manifestation of the Spirit of God when you walk in love and you feel love when you walk into a place. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to have to run. Um, last question was, uh, Jesus confirmed uh, his message with signs and wonders. Um, shouldn't we be seeing that today? Shouldn't our message be confirmed with signs and wonders? Um, and, and one of the things that we want to understand uh, is, is this point. I, I want to say something right after you say that. Go ahead and share Acts 2. The Bible says in Acts 2 and verse 22 that the people of Israel, listen, this is the Apostle Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost. When 120 people staggered out of the upper room speaking in other tongues, they thought they were drunk. Mm -hmm. He said, they're not drunk, but this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. Amen. It was a direct fulfillment of prophecy. And then here's what Peter said to them on the day of Pentecost. He said, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him. And, and that's not to say that our message will not also be filled with signs and wonders, but we want you to understand that Jesus was being affirmed and confirmed by his Father in heaven about his identity. We have a confirmation of who Jesus is. It's called the cross. We already know who he is because we watched him go to the cross, we, or, we, or we know that he went to the cross. We hear the miracles and the wonders that he did up to the cross, and we understand that the greatest miracle is salvation, the greatest sign, the greatest wonder. So we no longer have to confirm, we no longer have to confirm who Jesus is. We already know. We already know. He ultimately proved himself to us, and we will see signs and wonders, but let's make sure we understand something. 
that we are seeing signs and wonders. Signs and wonders should follow us, and they don't always look like what we have called in the past a move of God. Signs and wonders should follow us, not us follow them, right? We hit that. Now watch this. If we're not careful, we forget the greatest of all the wonders. Yes. Can I tell you today that the great, God's greatest gift is not the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. God's greatest gift is not the gift of prophecy. It's not the gift of discernment. It's not the gift of laying on of hands. It's not the gift of healing. You know what the God's greatest gift is? Salvation. Yes. Watch this. God's greatest gift, the, the most mighty move of his spirit is this. It's the gift of salvation because the greatest miracle happened when God became man. The Bible says Emmanuel, which means God with us. A holy God left heaven, a perfect place to come to a, a, a broken world to give his life. Listen, the greatest miracle was, was that God sent his son to die so that you and I could have life. I love what C.S. Lewis, the, the author of Narnia, said. Here's what he said. He said, the Son of God became a man so that men might become the sons of God. Amen. That is the greatest miracle. Can you see? Amen. amen. The first and best sign that needs to follow us is that we are saved. The word saved is sozo. And sozo is a word that is, mean, is meant by being complete. It means that we are saved that we are healed, and that we are delivered. The greatest sign and wonder that should follow us is that we walk through this world saved, healed. Now remember, we always go, well, we'll lay hands on the sick, and the sick will, will recover. We believe in physical healing, and we're going to spend an entire service on does God still heal physically. But we have to remember that some of the greatest miracles that God has done, especially here at Restore, is healed us emotionally. Come on. Come on. There are some of us, we were absolute basket cases. And if some of you women won't say amen, your husband next to you wants to shout it for you. Because we have been healed emotionally. We have been healed so spiritually that we begin to want to get close to the God that we were once afraid of or mad at. Are you with me? That healing is more than just bodily, but we're healed in our soul. For some of us, our memories have been healed. God has changed what goes on on the inside of our head. He's renewed our mind. That is a sign that should follow us. I would rather have a sign for the unbeliever be seeing a believer walk in wholeness, who is healed, who walks in love, who knows how to embrace their child when they're hurting, who knows how to love on the cashier that was rude to them, that knows how to not undercut their sister-in-law at the family dinner because she understands that we're all a work in progress. That is the sign of the believer I would rather see, is that we are whole and we are saved and we are healed. I'm going to tell you that I'm, I spoke of just a moment ago, and we're going to wrap it up with the Brownsville Revival. We went when we were early on in our marriage. If you don't know anything about the Brownsville Revival, pastor's going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you what made the Brownsville Revival, the outpouring that it was, was not because of, 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 of any type of manifestation that we used to point to, saying that's a move of God. It was because people were being saved and healed and delivered, and set free. Um, relationships were being restored. People were literally walking up to one another or across the thing and hugging one another. There was true transformation happening in that place. February of 97, Jennifer and I were married just a couple of months and new, newly on the road, and we jumped in the car and drove nine hours with a couple of stops here and there from Zotho Springs to Pensacola, Florida, to be a part of a mighty move of God called the Pensacola Outpouring, a.k.a. the Brownsville Revival. Can I tell you, we got there, and we were told that if you want to go, you better get there early. And I don't in. mean early as in an hour early. We showed up at 9 o'clock in the morning, and church started at 7 o'clock yeah. at night. Yeah. There was a crowd of people 
in the parking lot. And the Spirit of God was so strong in the parking lot that people were getting saved on the sidewalk before they ever walked in the sanctuary. It Come literally on, looked like you were waiting to get, in, you know, Disney waiting World. for tickets to Journey or something. Yeah, literally. Crazy. I mean, people were hung yeah. out overnight in order to get in line to get in the building. Now, and they had three overflow buildings. Here, here's the thing. Brownsville within the, the, the years that it went on, had 4 million people from all over the world make the journey to Brownsville, Florida, or to Brownsville, Pensacola, Florida, to be a part of a mighty move of God. Mm -hmm. More than 200,000 people gave their life to Christ in that revival. And you know what it was? It wasn't because the pastor had magic hands, but instead the pastor and the entire congregation prayed for two and a half years solid without fail that revival would show up in Pensacola, Florida. And then you know what happened? The people bought on, they began to pray, and all of a sudden the spirit of expectation swept through the congregation and out in the community. So much so that we saw an incredible signs and wonders during that revival. But my question to you today is this. Can you imagine if we as a body of believers here in Ocean Way at Restore Church started praying for revival and showed up early in the morning and began to pray and, and invite people? Come on. We want to grow, but we don't invite anybody. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God swept through that place like never, ever before. It, it, I remember hearing, the, and I gotta, I'm not going to lie to you, man. We've heard better musicians. Linda Cooler was amazing. We've heard better. John Kilpatrick, the pastor, was great. I've heard better. Steve Hill, the evangelist, was great, but I've heard better. What we were sitting them? there, and I got, I'm not going to lie to you, sitting there, and, and it was hard for me not to be judgmental because I heard some of the best preachers in the world that I was actually brought up under. Mm -hmm. But what was different was the anointing mm -hmm. and the expectation. And it wasn't about them, and they knew it. When they gave an altar call, he didn't have to pull teeth. People ran to the altar to get saved. But they expected it. They ex if, you're gonna, if you're going to have 18 hours invested to get through those doors, you come with an expectation. We're not walking in punching a time clock. We're not walking in and listening to a message with arms folded and trying to stay awake. I mean, it was, it was, there was expectation. Can you imagine that? I mean, I, I, I'm sorry to, to just kind of put it out there like this. We were saying it the other day. When we get to the place where we're also ready to serve the church like we want God to show up in the church, then we'll see revival. But if when we're put on a calendar, um, it, it, it bothers us or it's an interruption to our life or we're like, oh, geez, got to serve again, that will not bring revival. That's that expectation that is not there because this is the house of God. If we serve the house of God. See, the problem is, is that oftentimes we, and I'm going to say we, we want the hand of God, but we don't seek the heart of God. We want his blessings, we want his benefits, but we don't necessarily want the inconvenience of showing up and being on a daily basis the hands and feet of God. Come on, come on. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We, we, we've got to wrap this up, and here's, here's what we wrote down very late last night. We want the sensation, but not the sacrifice. And I'll be honest with you, most people showed up and drove that long and came in for those numbers of years for the outpouring of God's Spirit, and they were there for something. But what they didn't know is the two and a half years of prayer and praise and getting on their faces and seeking God and serving the church and loving people, even when it wasn't shown up. And that's where it is. It's, like, it's the equivalent of going in this generation. Uh, I want to live in the mansion and be an NFL star, but I don't want to show up for practice. Yeah, I mean, there's a discipline that must take place first. And here's the last thing that we're going to write on this. There are no shortcuts to experiencing God's power. Oftentimes, we ask for an experience because we're looking for a shortcut. Come on. Come on. I used to say to God, Lord, just fall on me. Knock me out on the floor and change me. Until I realized I was asking for that because I needed a shortcut. I didn't want to do the hard work of crucifying my flesh, changing my thoughts, getting into the Word, and being before the Lord every day. Sorry, I said I was going to have a conversation, not preach today. There are no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. 
If we truly want God's power, then we must pursue his presence. If we want his hand, then seek his face. If you want his benefits, then crawl up in daddy's lap and love on him. My kids, they get an outpouring of our love when they want to love on us. But when they want to just come to us for stuff, I could see right through that junk. Every parent say amen. amen. And if we want to be a part, seriously, if we truly want to be a part of making people whole, then we've got to pursue our own personal ho holiness. Because holiness precedes his power. We can't ask for God's power if we're not walking in holiness, if we're not seeking his heart, if we're not looking for what moves God's hand. What moves his hand is our love, is our praise, is us walking in the spirit, not just going, God, I want a manifestation of your spirit. Come on, where are you? Because that's what creates church hoppers. That's what creates people coming out of a church looking for somewhere else where they can get goosebumps and they can feel all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to be real honest with you. If you walk up to a person that just goes, man, we had church today, and you ask them, what they preach on? What was the word about? What was, what was the challenge? And they'll go, oh, I have no idea what they preached on, but man, I felt God. Be careful because that's okay every now and again. But if it's all just about a feeling and an experience and a shout, but we don't have value for the word and for God's spirit um, and, and devotion and, and discipline in his spirit to walk after those things, then what we have is we have a place to shout. Shout in your living room because you have such devotion and love for God that his presence fills up your living room. Let me tell you something. Some of the greatest times that Anthony and I have ever had are not in front of people. They're not at a church. It's in our, in our own time, in our own living room, or in our own cars where the spirit of the Lord just comes in. Because why? We were loving him and praising him. Because we were seeking him. Because we wanted his heart, not his hand. Because we wanted him, not his benefits. And that makes all the difference in the entire world. Come on, would you give the Lord a hand clap? We're going to wrap it up on this. And I'm going to be honest with you. We're going to do this another couple of weeks. And I will promise you. And I will prophesy this to you. You will see the Spirit of God fall in this place in a very real and a very powerful way. It will not be because this man had this man play the music louder and get us all stirred up. It will not be because we're seeking after his hand. It'll be because the Spirit of the Lord is here and we have learn God's word and we have understood who God is in our lives and what our identity is in Christ and we get so hungry and on fire for him that we stop we stop checking our Facebook before we go to our devotion in the morning and that we stop doing business elsewhere before we start doing business with God is somebody with me you will see it because the prophecy that has been on my husband at least six times in six different places all the same prophecy that you will see blind eyes open and deaf ears will here and arms and legs will grow out that the physical manifestations of God and miracle power will be upon your ministry not a doubt I've seen it I've listened to it I've watched people walk through and say I've got a word for you and they didn't know my husband and they didn't know the last guy that prophesied it to him either two years before it we will see it but here's the how we'll see it it will be because we open up our hearts to God and we get on fire for him and we pray for the fire of God to fall because we desire more of him and less of ourselves. That we start serving the church and start serving it like we're serving God himself. It will be because we are so in love with him that we want him over and more than anything else. And not because we're seeking an experience, but we're seeking an encounter with a living God who will change us from the inside out. Amen. Amen. If we write the, the thing, if we write a question, and this is how we end it, I have experienced his power only twice in my life, and I miss this so much. Without it, I feel 
like I'm dead with dry bones. Can I say this to you? We don't have to miss anything because the Spirit of the Lord is there for our taking. He is there for our meeting with Him. He is there for us talking with Him. He is there for us worshiping Him. He is there. We don't have to miss anything. We don't have to wonder where He went. He's here with us at all times, no matter where we go. And we have already determined that He is here in this house. So we don't have to want for anything. We don't have to want for anything. We're just going to go to the Lord in prayer, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to say, Lord, if you truly want the power and the presence of God, we're going to be teaching on all of those things that somehow are so, um, sometimes they're scary because they're foreign and we don't understand them. We're going to be teaching on them. But more than that, what we're asking of you in this place today is that we would bow our hearts to God and say, Lord, I know there's more. I know there's more. I know there's more of your spirit. I know there's more of your power. I know that there's more than what I know. And if you're here today and you've been punching a time clock with God, if you're here and serving the church is a drudgery, and not something that you do as unto the Lord. I get it. I've been there. I've been there. This series is stretching us. This series is reminding us of what's truly important. So I'm going to ask you today, and what we desire for you is that you and I, we would become people that get on our face before God, and we say, Lord, I've been seeking your hand, but I want to seek your face now. I've been seeking your benefits, but now I'm coming because I truly want to live for you, not just fit you into my life. We want you today to just examine your heart and and make it right with him and say, Lord, I I want you to redo this. I, I want you to just mess me up a little bit. I want you to get me to where I'm longing for more of your presence. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, that's exactly where I am. I do need more of him. If you're here today and you just say, I, I want to go all out for Christ. I've never been. And I've got questions and I've got concerns and, and, and I'll understand some things. But that's okay because I want to bow my heart to God. If that's you right now, just stretch up your hand right where you're at. Come on. Come on, when we become a church that desires for the presence of God in this place to be so thick that when people walk through the door, they don't want to sit down. They want to come to the altar and pray. They want to come to the altar and give their hearts to God. That's what I'm talking about. When the Spirit of God sits down in this place, you won't be able to stay in your seat. You won't be able to stay in your seat. People will come. Those doors will open and will be flooded with people that say, there's something here. And I'm drawn here by the power and the presence of God. We're going to go ahead and pray, and we're just going to leave it like this. We're going to leave it as a challenge that each of us would find ourselves in that place where we're seeking holiness. Holiness. That we're seeking to become more like Him, that we're seeking of having it be more about Him. Less of us, more of Him. That's our challenge today. Can we just raise our hands and surrender right now? Can we do that? I'm going to pray corporately right now. Father, today, as we raise our hands up symbolically saying, I surrender. Father, we surrender our hearts to you. And God, I pray that you will do something new inside of us. God, I pray that today was, as I said in the very beginning, a divine revelation of what you want and what you have for us. Father, thank you for teaching us leading us, guiding us, directing us. Spirit of God, we give you praise for that. God, I pray that you'll take us deeper. God, I pray that we'll no longer uh, uh, play in the ankle-deep waters of the Spirit, but God, we'll get out over our head so we won't depend on anybody else except you and you alone. Father, that's our prayer today. God, that you would speak to our minds, but more importantly, speak to our heart. 
God, let us dig deep, search the scriptures for what you have for us. And we thank you, God, for a spirit of expectation to sweep over Restore Church like never before. God, I pray that this church, as we prayed before, will be a magnet and will be a hub, God, for people that are broken. Lord, to come in here and be made whole and be restored by your power and by your presence. We give you praise for it all, God. In the name of Jesus, I say, amen. We've asked Pastor John, if he would, to play look what the Lord has done as we're leaving today because there's going to be a time. And for many of us already, we can say, look what the Lord has done. He sozoed me. He's healed me. He's saved me. He's delivered me. He's set me free. And he's already done it. And we have to have an expectation that he'll do more of it. Come Amen. On. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship as we leave. Come on, guys. May the rest of your week be, be the, the best, best of, of your, your week. week. Come on. Let's leave this place with a shout of praise. Come Amen. on. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. My body, he touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. Oh, I'm gonna praise his name. Each day he's just the same. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Come on now, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body touch my mind he saved me it was just a